Good morning, and welcome to the reading for Monday, um, February 14th. I know I've skipped a little bit. Sorry, I can go back and fill those blanks in, um, but I want to make sure that you have what you need for Monday, um, just in case you're absent. So we're going to be on 186. If you have a book, we're going to read from 186 to 195. One day while Brian and I were scrounging around on the edge of our property, he picked up a piece of rotting lumber, and there among the pill bugs and night crawlers was a diamond ring. The stone was big. At first we thought it was just neat junk, but we spit polished it and scratched the glass with it, or scratched glass with it like Dad had shown us, and it seemed real. We figured it must have belonged to the old lady who had lived there. She had died before we moved in. Everyone said she was a little loopy. What do you think it's worth? I asked Brian. Probably more than the house, he said. We figured we could sell it and buy food, pay off the house. Mom and Dad kept missing monthly payments, and there was talk we were going to be evicted, and maybe still have enough left over for something special, like a new pair of sneakers for each of us. We brought the ring home and showed it to Mom. She held it up to the light and said we needed to have it appraised. The next day, she took the Trailways bus to Bluefield. When she returned, she told us it was a genuine two-carat diamond. So what's it worth, I asked. That doesn't matter, Mom said. How come? Because we're not selling it. She was giving it, or keeping it, she explained, to replace the wedding ring her mother had given her, the one that Dad had pawned shortly after they got married. But Mom, I said, that ring could get us a lot of food. That's true, Mom said, but it could also improve my self-esteem. And at times like these, self-esteem is even more vital than food. Mom's self-esteem did need some shoring up. Sometimes things just got to her. She retreated to her sofa bed and stayed there for days on end, crying and occasionally throwing things at us. She could have been a famous artist by now, she yelled, if she hadn't had children, and none of us appreciated her sacrifice. The next day if the mood had passed, she'd be painting and humming away as if nothing had happened. One Saturday morning, not long after Mom started wearing her new diamond ring, her mood was on an upswing, and she decided we'd all clean the house. I thought this was a great idea. I told mom we should empty out each room, clean it thoroughly, and put back only the things that were essential. That was the one way it seemed to me to get rid of the clutter. But mom said my idea was too time consuming. So all we ended up doing was straightening the piles of papers into stacks and stuffing dirty clothes into the chest of drawers. Mom insisted that we chant Hail Marys while we work. It's a way of cleansing our souls while we're cleaning house, she said. We're tilling, killing two birds with one stone. The reason she had become a tad moody, she said later that day, was that she hadn't been getting enough exercise. I'm going to start going, doing calisthenics, she announced. Once you get your circulation going, it changes your entire outlook on life. She leaned over and touched her toes. When she came up, she said she was feeling better already and went down for another toe touch. I watched from the writing desk with my arms folded across my, ch my chest. I knew the problem was not that we all had poor circulation. We didn't need to start doing toe touches. We needed to take drastic measures. I was 12 by now, and I'd been weighing our options, doing some research at the public library, and picking up scraps of information about how other families on Little Hobart Street survived. I'd come up with a plan and been, had been waiting for the opportunity to broach it with Mom. The moment seemed ripe. Mom. We can't go on living like this, I said. It's not so bad, she said. Between each toe touch, she was reaching into the air. We hadn't have, haven't had anything to eat but popcorn for three days, I said. You're always so negative, she said. You remind me of my mother. Criticize, criticize, criticize. I'm not being negative, I said. I'm trying to be realistic. I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances, she said. How come you never blame your father for anything? He's no saint, you know. I know, I said. I ran a finger along the edge of the desk. Dad was always parking cigarettes there, and it was ribbed with a row of black cigarette burns like a decorative border. Mom, you have to leave Dad, I said. She stopped doing toe touches. I can't believe you would say that, she said. I can't believe that you, of all people, would turn on your father. I was Dad's last defender, she continued, the only one who pretended to believe all his excuses and tales and to have faith in his plans for the future. He loves you so much, Mom said. How can you do this to him? I don't blame Dad, I said, and I didn't. 
but Dad seemed hell-bent on destroying himself, and I was afraid he was going to pull us all down with him. We've got to get away. But I can't leave your father, she said. I told Mom that if she left Dad, she'd be eligible for government aid, which she couldn't get now because she had an able-bodied husband. Some people at school, not to mention half the people on Little Hobart Street, were on welfare, and it wasn't so bad. I knew Mom was opposed to welfare. Those kids on foods got food stamps and clothing allowances. The state bought them coal and paid for their school lunches. Mom wouldn't hear it. Welfare, she said, would cause irreparable psychological damage to us kids. You can be hungry every now and then, but once you eat, you're okay, she said. And you can get cold for a while, but you always warm up. Once you go on welfare, it changes you. Even if you get off welfare, you'll never escape the stigma that you were a charity case. You're scarred for life. Fine, I said. If we're not charity cases, then get a job. There was a teacher shortage in McDowell County, just like there had been in Battle Mountain. She could get to work in a heartbeat, and when she had a salary, we could move into a little apartment in town. Sounds like an awful life, Mom said. Worse than this, I asked. Mom turned quiet. She seemed to be thinking. Then she looked up. She was smiling serenely. I can't leave your father, she said. It's against the, against the Catholic faith. Then she sighed. And anyway, you know your mom. I'm an excitement addict. Mom never told Dad I'd urged her to leave him. That summer, he still thought of me as his biggest supporter, given there was so little competition for the job I probably was. One afternoon in June, Dad and I were sitting out on the porch, our legs dangling over the side, looking down at the houses below. That summer was so hot I could barely breathe. It seemed hotter than Phoenix or Battle Mountain, where it regularly climbed above 100 degrees. So when Dad told me it was only 90 degrees, I said the thermometer must be broken. But he said no. We were used to dry desert heat, and this was humid heat. It was a lot hotter, Dad pointed out, down in the valley along Stewart Street, which was lined with those cute little brick houses that had neat square lawns and corrugated aluminum breezeways. The valleys trapped the heat. Our house was the highest on the mountainside, which made it ergo the coolest spot in Welch. In case of flooding, as we had seen, it was the safest. You didn't know I put a lot of thought into where we should live, did you? He asked me. Real estate's about three things, Mountain Goat. Location, location, location. Dad started laughing. It was a silent laugh that made his shoulders shake, and the more he laughed, the funnier, funnier it seemed to him, which made him laugh even harder. I had to start laughing too, and soon we were both hysterical, lying on our backs, tears running down our cheeks, slapping our feet on the porch floor. We get too winded to laugh any further, our, our sides cramping with stitches, and we think our fit was over, but then one of us would start chuckling, and that would get to the other, the other one going, and again, we'd both end up shrieking like hyenas. The main source of relief from the heat for the kids in Welch was the public swimming pool down by the railroad tracks near the Esso station. Brian and I had gone swimming once, but Ernie Goad and his friends were there, and they started telling everybody that we Walls lived in garbage and would stink up the pool water something awful. That was Ernie Goad's opportunity to take, advent, take revenge for the Battle of Little Hobart Street. One of his friends came up with the phrase health epidemic, and they were going on to the parents and lifeguards that we needed to be ejected to prevent an outbreak at the pool. Brian and I decided to leave. As we were walking away, Ernie Goad came up to the chain link fence. Go on home to the garbage dump, he shouted. His voice was shrill with triumph. Go on now and don't come back. A week later, with the heat still holding, I ran into Denisha Hewitt downtown. She had just come from the pool and had her hair, wet hair pulled back under a scarf. Brother, that water felt good, she said, drawing out the word good so it sounded like it had about 15 O's in it. You ever go swimming? They don't like us there, I said. Denisha nodded, even though I hadn't explained. Then she said, why don't you come swim with us in the morning? By us, I knew she meant other black people. The pool was not segregated. Anyone could swim at any time, technically at least, but the fact that all the black people swam in the morning when the pool was free and all the white people swam in the afternoon when the admission was 50 cents. No one had planned this arrangement and no rules enforced it. That was just the way it was. I, sure, I surely wanted to get back in that water, but I couldn't help but feel that if I took Denish up on the offer, I'd be violating some sort of taboo. Wouldn't anybody get mad? I asked. Because you're white? She asked. Your own might, but we won't, and your kind won't be there. The next morning, I met Denisha in front of the pool entrance. My thrift, my thrift shop one piece rolled inside my fray grade towel. The white girl checking the entrance clerk at the entrance booth gave me a surprised look when we passed through the gate, but she said nothing. 
The women's locker room was dark and smelled of pine saw with cinder block walls and a wet cement floor. A soul tune was blasting out of an eight track tape player and all the black women packed between the peeling wooden benches were singing and dancing to the music. In the locker rooms, I'd been in, the white women always seemed embarrassed by their nakedness and wrapped towels around their waist before slipping off their underpants. But here, most of the women were buck naked. Some of them were skinny, with angular hips, jutting collarbones. Others had big willoughby, willowy behinds, and they were bumping their butts together and, and pressing up against each other as they danced. As soon as the women saw me, they stopped dancing. One of the naked ones came over and stood in front of me. She was so close, I was terrified she was going to touch me. Denisha explained that I was with her and that I was good people. The women looked at one another and shrugged. I was going on 13 and self-conscious, so I planned to slip into my bathing suit, un slip my bathing suit on underneath my dress, but I was worried that this would only make me more conspicuous. So I took a deep breath and stepped out of my clothes. The scar in my ribs was about the size of my outstretched hand and Denisha noticed it immediately. I explained that I had gotten it when I was three and that I had been in the hospital for six weeks getting skin grafts and that was why I never wore a bikini. Denisha ran her fingers lightly over the scar tissue. It ain't so bad, she said. There's a little exchange I'm not going to read on YouTube next. That was a, and so there's a little dialogue with the girls while she's naked. That it was a line I'd heard Denisha use. She smiled at it, and all the women shrieked with laughter. One of the dancers bumped her hip up against me. I felt welcome enough to give a saucy bump back. Denisha and I stayed in the pool all morning, splashing and practicing the backstroke and the butterfly. She flailed around in the water almost as much as I did. We stood on our hands and stuck our legs out of the water, did underwater twists, and played Marco Polo and chicken with the other kids. We climbed out to do cannonballs and watermelons off the side, making big geyser-like splashes intended to drench as many people sitting poolside as possible. The blue water sparkled and churned, white with foam. By the time the free swim was over, my fingers and toes were completely wrinkled. My eyes were red from stinging, stinging from the chlorine, which was so strong it wafted up from the pool in a vapor you could practically see. I'd never felt cleaner. That afternoon, I was alone in the house, still enjoying the, the itchy, dry feeling of my chlorine-scoured skin and the wobbly-boned feeling you get from a lot of exercise when I heard a knock on the door. The noise startled me. Almost no one ever visited us at 93 Little Hobart Street. I opened the door a few inches and peered out. A balding man carrying a file folder under his arm stood out on the porch. Something about him said government, a species dad had trained us to avoid. Is the head of household in? He asked. Who wants to know? I said. The man smiled the way you do to sugarcoat bad news. I'm with child welfare and I'm looking for either Rex or Rosemary Walls, he said. They're not here, I said. How old are you? He asked. Twelve. Can I come in? I could see he was trying to peer behind me into the house. I pulled the door all the way closed except for a crack. Mom and Dad wouldn't want me to let you in, I said, unless they talk to their attorney. I added to impress him. Just tell me what it is you're after and I'll pass on the message. The man said that someone whose name he was not at liberty to discuss had called his office recommending an inquiry into the conditions at 93 Little Hobart Street, where it was possible that dependent children might be living in a state of neglect. No one's neglecting us, I said. You sure? I'm sure, mister. Dad work? Of course, he said, or I said. He does odd jobs. He's a bit of an entrepreneur. He's developing a technology that would burn low-grade bituminous fuel coal safely and efficiently. And your mother? She's an artist, I said, and a writer, and a teacher. Really? The man made note on a pad. Where? I don't really think Mom and Dad would want me talking to you without them here, I said. Come back when they're here. They'll answer your questions. Good, the man said. I'll come back. Tell them that. He passed his business card through the crack in the doorway. I watched him make his way around, or way down to the ground. Careful on those stairs now, I called. We're in the process of building a new set. After the man left, I was so furious that I ran up the hillside and started hurling rocks, big rocks, and it took, that it took two hands to lift into the garbage pit. Except for Irma, I never hated any more, one more than I hated that child wel welfare man. Not even Ernie Good. At least when Ernie and his gang came around yelling we were trash, we could fight them off with rocks. 
But if the child welfare man got into his head that we were an unfit family, we'd have no way to drive him off. He'd launch an investigation, and he'd end up sending me and Brian and Lori and Maureen off to live with different families, even though we all got good grades and knew Morse code. Couldn't let that happen. No one was going to lose Brian. No way I was going to lose Brian and Lori and Maureen. I wish we could do the skedaddle. For a long time, Brian, Lori, and I had assumed we would leave Welch sooner or later. Every couple of months, we'd ask Dad if we were going to move on. He'd sometimes talk about Australia or Alaska, but he never took any action. And when we asked Mom, she'd start singing some song about how her get up and go had got up and went. Maybe coming back to Welch had killed the idea Dad used to have of himself as a man going places. The truth was, we were stuck. When I got home, I gave her the man's card and told her about... When Mom got home, I gave her the man's card and told her about his visit. I was still in a lather. She said that ne since neither she nor Dad could be bothered to work, I said that since ne whoa, I said that since neither she nor Dad could be bothered to work, and since she refused to leave Dad, the government was going to do the job of, of splitting up the family for her. I expected Mom to come back with one of her choice remarks, but she listened to my tirade in silence. She said she needed to consider her options. She sat down at her easel. She had run out of canvases and be had began painting on plywood, so she picked up a piece of wood, got out her palette, squeezed some paints on it, and selected a brush. What are you doing? I asked. I'm thinking, she said. Mom worked quickly, automatically, as if she knew exactly what she wanted to paint. A figure took shape in the middle of the board. It was a woman for the waist up, with her arms raised. Blue concentric circles appeared around her waist. The blue was water. Mom was painting a picture of a woman drowning in a stormy lake. When she was finished, she sat for a long time in silence, staring at the picture. What are we going to do? I finally asked. Jeanette, you're so focused, it's scary. You didn't answer my question, I said. I'll get a job, Jeanette, she snapped. She threw her paintbrush into the jar that held her turpentine and sat there looking at the drowning woman.